Well, good morning and welcome again to Christ Church. My name is Michael. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm grateful to have the chance to, um, to uh, preach for a little bit this morning uh, from Matthew 2 and Luke 2. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to Matthew 2 and Luke 2. We're going to be in those two places. You can kind of put a piece of paper or hold your finger in one and look at the other one, uh, Matthew 2, Luke 2. While you're turning there, uh, let me just say happy January 8th. I hope your resolutions are going well so far this, uh, this 2017. If you were confused because you went to Walmart looking for exercise equipment and it wasn't in its normal spot, it's actually at the front of the store right now. So that's where you'll find it. But don't be too concerned by this. It'll be back in its proper place in the back corner before too long uh, where it belongs. I do hope, though, that you made some sort of a resolution to read the Bible this year. 2017, not a bad year. I mean, there's never a bad year to, to start reading some portion of Scripture. Um, you may not know this, but in less than two hours a week, you can actually read the whole Bible in a year, cover to cover. So that means if you watch uh, four shows, like four hour-long shows, if you just took half of your TV time, made it Bible time, then, then that's, that's it. Whole Bible, cover to cover, 15 minutes a day is about what it takes, give or take a little bit. And some of you are thinking, well, I watch on Netflix, and so I don't watch commercials. Yeah, but if you watch on Netflix, we all know we don't watch just one episode, okay? So take some of your Netflix time, make it Bible ring time. And if, if all, the whole Bible is a little bit much for you, if that's not where you are, totally get it. This is not a guilt thing. Uh, if any, it's not a right or wrong thing. If anything, it's more of a wisdom thing. I do, I do plead with you and encourage you and challenge you to read some portion of the Bible on a regular basis, even if it's just a little bit, even if it's the same chapter every day all year long. That'd be kind of weird, but hey, just some portion of the scriptures. It's interesting for me personally right now because um, I, I'm not a big predictor of things uh, at the first of the year or any other time, but I do predict that in 2017, skepticism toward the Bible will only increase in our culture. Skepticism toward it will probably grow. And so at a time when there's a, a growing, uh, I don't believe the Bible's the word of God, or I don't want to read it, or I don't think it's a very good book, it's funny for me, not funny, it's ironic for me because my own personal confidence, I'm not just saying this, my own personal confidence that this book is, is from God and is, is powerful and, and makes us the people we're made to be has never been higher. Uh, but the proof is in the pudding, they say, and um, I do believe that the, the best proof of the Bible's truthfulness is a life that demonstrates its power. So let's open it up and uh, see what it has to say to us. Matthew 2 and Luke 2, we're continuing our, uh, our, our journey called the gospel, where we're walking through the gospel stories, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in chronological order. And our goal is to discover who Jesus is. What kind of offers does he, he, he offer? What kind of demands does he demand? Why is he a person who is worth listening to, a person who's worth following uh, and today we're going to look at the final events of Jesus' childhood. So far we've been looking at the things leading up to his birth and then his actual birth. And today we're going to look at the last of what the gospel writers tell us before we meet Jesus as an adult. So after this point, he's 30 years old. This is the last of, of boy Jesus. And we're going to look at two stories today. Uh, both of the stories, however, give us one main point. I'll give you the point now so we can kind of be chewing on it through the morning and then we'll, we'll look at what they say. Here's, here's, I think, what we'll learn. You don't have to understand everything to take the next step of faith in Jesus. That's what I want to talk about today. Repetition's probably not a bad idea. Let me say it again. You don't have to understand everything to take the next step of faith in Jesus. So here's our plan. We're going to look at these two stories, fill in some of the details, make sure we understand what went down, and then we'll come back to focus back on this one point and, uh, and then see if at the end we can't find a few practical ways to respond. So first story, Matthew chapter 2. You can turn over there now. Matthew 2. We're going to look at the whole thing. Um, again, filling in some blanks. As we read, you'll notice something. Matthew is telling the story, and then he'll quote the Old Testament. Then he'll tell the story, and then he'll quote some Old Testament. And the reason he keeps going back and forth, don't be confused by it, he's just trying to show that what's happening is fulfilling uh, what the story said was going to go down, and really the story as a whole. So Matthew chapter 2, uh, start by just reading the first couple verses and uh, figuring out the major players in this story. Verse uh, 1, chapter 2, Matthew. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. Let's just pause right there. 
Who are these people? Where'd they come from? What's going on here? Who are these people They're called the Magi? Uh, it's kind of short for magician, but don't think, uh, you know, top hat doing tricks. They were more, um, they were from Persia. So they were like Persian priests and astrologers who would interpret the stars and the planets and interpret daily life and try to help people understand here's where God is moving. So they were uh, religious figures, science type figures. They're pretty interesting guys from Persia. If you, if you know the old song, we three kings of Orient are, sorry, Bible never says they're kings, uh, but they're, they're coming, right? So they're from Persia and they're priests of a sort and they travel, how far? 1,000 miles, thereabouts, give or take a few. Long journey. Would have taken many months to make this journey 1,000 miles from where they live in ancient Persia, uh, probably modern day like Iran, uh, to, to where they're headed, Jerusalem. Uh, and they actually didn't come, uh, they didn't show up like the day after Jesus was born. You probably need to adjust your nativity scenes because really, based on what this story tells us, it was about two years. So they see this star up in the sky and then they start making preparations for this journey, and then they do this journey, and then they show up two years later. So you, you need to leave your nativity out till like April at least, and start the Magi in another part of the house, and then every week just move them a little bit closer, and they meet little baby Jesus. So he's not still in diapers, but he's still just a little guy toddling around. Um, and so they show up when Jesus is about two. Why'd they come? They saw a star. What does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> There's a couple of options. Could be a comet. That maybe it explains the movement. Could be just God sent an angel or put a light in the sky. One theory I think is kind of interesting, uh, at least maybe this is what they were thinking. Around the time these went, this, this happened, there was a time when Jupiter and Saturn, the planets Jupiter and Saturn, aligned. This happens occasionally, and you can see this stuff often more closely than normal. And remember, they chart the stars. And in their worldview, in their mythology, Jupiter was the royal planet, the king planet. And Saturn, for whatever reason, was the one that represented the Jewish nation. And so if these two planets aligned and they saw this, they would draw the conclusion that there is a king in Israel or a king of the Jews. I think that may be what they saw or thought they saw. And then they asked around, found out about some prophecies and made the journey here. So that's these people. They show up because they want to worship the new king of the Jews. So they go to Jerusalem, find King Herod, ask for some help. Let's pick it up in verse 3, chapter 2, verse 3. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel." Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. And as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. We'll talk about this King Herod guy in a little bit. Uh, you can kind of tell even just reading the story, he's lying. Okay, He does not want to worship him, but he doesn't want to know where he is. So he's lying because he's opposing what God is doing, but God is so good that Herod, in his deceitfulness, actually helps move the story along, tells the Magi, you know, where it's supposed to be. Pick it up, verse 9. After they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it, when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed, and on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So basically, they treat him like kings, like a king. These, these, these guys show up, and they bring their gifts, and they bow down before him, and they bend a knee, and they demonstrate their homage to this king. And they give them gold and frankincense and myrrh. I totally expected that I was doing a little digging and I was going to find some really interesting things about gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It's not really all that interesting. I don't know if you know this, but gold is a really valuable yellow-like substance that you could use for decorating things. And it's nice and expensive. And uh, frankincense and myrrh are both like aloes or, or perfumes or, uh, but don't think liquid. They're, they're basically incense. They smell really good. They're really expensive. They're bringing, re they come out of the, the, uh, the sap from certain trees where these guys are from. So they're bringing really expensive gifts and they're giving them to Jesus like he's a king. That money from those gifts is going to come in handy with what happens next. Verse 13, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. 
Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he'd learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. So Joseph uh, hears from God in a dream, move your family because the king is coming for you. And he, I think, using this money from these gifts, did exactly what God said. And then Herod, realizing he's been outwitted, he just slaughters all the little boys in this area. Now don't picture like a mass killing, but do picture anywhere between 10 and 30 families losing their sons, their baby sons. It's probably about the numbers based on the size of Bethlehem at the time. I mean, a couple dozen boys killed. Now, this was par for the course course for Herod. If you knew him, you wouldn't be surprised by this. He was called Herod the Great, but it wasn't because he was a nice guy. He built big buildings, and he killed lots of people. He would, if he suspected you of, of trying to plot against him, he would off you immediately. Even his wife, wives, I should say. He had 10 wives. He killed his favorite wife and her sons because somebody started a rumor that one of them wanted the throne. As soon as he found out, gone. That's the kind of leader Herod is. You threaten his throne, you're gone. And so he kills all these baby boys. Pick it up in verse 19. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in place of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, another one, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So what was fulfilled, what was said through the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. There are many important truths in this story. Helpful truths, disturbing truths. Some for us, some for our world. We can't talk about all of them. So let's focus ourselves on this. You don't have to understand everything to take the next step of faith in Jesus. Don't have to have the whole picture. Just got to know how to do this. Luke chapter 2, second story. Uh, We're looking at the end of Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 40 and on through the rest of the chapter, about 12 verses, 40 through 52. Here's what we read in Luke. So that was Matthew's last story before Jesus' adulthood. This is Luke's last story before Jesus' adulthood. Here's what it says, verse 40. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom And after the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day, and then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends, and they did not find him. They went back to Jerusalem to look for him. Now, let me just pause right there. They're not as bad of parents as they seem, okay? Now, when you read this story, you think, man, so... We should have called child services on Jesus' folks. Like, that's how bad it was. Wasn't that bad? Now, you may have seen situations like this. I don't know if I've ever told you about the time I met the Virgin Mary in downtown Los Angeles. I was um, shooting some videos for a church I worked at at the time, and this lady was kind of watching us, and she came over, and she was like, I got a message for the people on the other side of your video. And we're like, oh, okay. Put the mic up, put the video on. And she says, I'm not kidding. She's like, um, <clears throat> I'm the Virgin Mary, and my son is Jesus Christ. And I'm like, what do I say next, you know? (laughs) So I said, what you would say, can I meet him? (laughs) So she pulls this 12-year-old boy over, and we talk to him, and sure enough, like, she's told him that he is Jesus, and I'm thinking, I don't know whether to laugh or call the authorities, you know? Like, that's bad parenting. This, not bad parenting. They would have traveled from Nazareth to Jerusalem in a pack, like a caravan with family and friends. All the people from that area would have come together. And so it's just not that odd. You know, where's Jesus? Oh, he's over with Harry and Johnny. He's fine. You know, he's the oldest anyway. He can take care of himself. So they just think he's with somebody else. About a day in, they, okay, we probably ought to find him. Gee, no, oh, 
There's Harry. There's Johnny. No Jesus. Uh Uh-oh. So they go back. Now, I cannot imagine what this would feel like. Cannot imagine. Like, I I lose my kids for 10 seconds at Walmart, and I freak out. And they're on the other side of the aisle, you know. Like, where'd you go? Scary. So they look for him. Let's pick it up, verse, uh, verse 46. After three days, they found him. In the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. And he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Three days. Three days. And where'd they find him? Sitting among the teachers who were marveling at his answers. And don't miss, please don't miss verse 50. But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Luke gives us one story. We get one story about Jesus between the ages of 2 and 30. And in this one story, he is confusing the people who are closest to him. If you've ever found Jesus confusing, if you've ever not been able to understand what he was saying or doing in your life, you're in good company. Like here you have Joseph, a man about whom the Bible doesn't say a single negative word, and the Virgin Mary herself. And they have no idea what the heck Jesus is saying or doing. They're searching for him frantically, thinking they're going to find a terrified little boy, if they find him at all. And then they find him, and he's fine. So they do what you do. They scold at him. Jesus, what are you doing? Why are you doing this to us? And Jesus, he doesn't even apologize. He just says, what's wrong with you people? (laughs) You're not always going to be able to understand everything that Jesus is saying or doing, everything that Jesus said or did, but that's okay, because you don't have to understand everything to take the next step of faith in Jesus. Now, I stress this point for a couple reasons. I stress it because I think the text kind of puts it in our face. I think this is what the the Bible, this is what God, the Holy Spirit's wanting us to focus on today. So I think that the stories make this clear to us. I also stress it because I think it's something that each of us, all of us, need to either learn or remember. I believe that in 2017, God will call 100% of the people in the room to do something. Every person here. I think he'll call all of us. He'll move all of us. He'll invite all of us to do something. For for some of us, it may actually be, for some of y'all walking across that initial line of faith, saying yes to Jesus for the first time, I'm going to put my faith, I'm going to put my confidence in you. I'm going to entrust my life to you. I accept the salvation you offer now and forever, and I devote my life to you. That's the decision some of you will be pulled toward. For others, a lot of you in this room, it's going to be helping somebody else cross that line of faith, telling somebody about Jesus, explaining why he's important, helping them understand, why do you guys get in the water and do the baptism thing? What's repentance? What actually is faith? What does the Bible mean? Talking them through that. For some of you, that's what it's going to be. For others, it's going to be something similarly big. Some of y'all probably need to update your passport So that when God says go, you're ready to go. I have no idea if he's going to, but he might. Now for most of us, it's going to be things that we think of as smaller. Serving the people around you in ways that may be annoying or beneath you. Hit and reset, perhaps, on the relationship that you have with your wife or your husband, with your children, with your coworkers. Maybe it's, maybe it's teaching your kids about God, starting that process. Maybe it's learning to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Or maybe it's learning to say, I forgive you. I don't know what it is, but I'm very confident that God is going to move in every person in the room's life, and he's going to, this is what he does in the book, right? He's going to do the same thing with us. He's going to ask us to do something, but I have to admit that I also think that probably about half of us won't do it because we don't understand everything ahead of time. God does not dot all the I's and cross all the T's. He doesn't. And a lot of us are going to say, but I don't really know why you're calling me to do this. I don't really understand how this is going to work out. And God does not lay it out for you ahead of time. He says, let's go. You say, where are you going? He says, I'll show you when you get there. You say, but I don't know if it's going to work. And he says, listen, in the name of me, would you just get on board, you know? Would you just move? But no, we won't because we're afraid. 
Afraid of what might happen, afraid of what it might cost, afraid that we might fail, afraid that we might mess things up, afraid that somebody else might, might think less of us, make fun of us. Some of y'all, not, not everybody, but a few of you probably, I mentioned something like, you know, reading the Bible regularly, and you think to yourself, you know what your first thought is? Man, if I tried to actually do that, my wife would, would laugh at me. My husband would mock me. My coworkers would, they would just, they would not let me live it down. Or they would start asking me all their spiritual questions, and I don't know the answers to them. I, I probably bet, better not. And I'll be honest with you, I'm, on, I'm not any better than y'all on this when it comes to wanting to figure everything out ahead of time. Like, I don't like to risk what matters unless I know 100%, here's how it's going to go. The problem is, though, God does not acquiesce to my demands or preferences. He just keeps telling me to trust him. You too. So let's see if we can't get a little bit practical and look at, here's what I want to do. Look at some of the characters in the story and see what they teach us about how to properly respond to this Jesus who doesn't always explain himself. I'll give you the first one. Three quick ones, and then the fourth one is the big one. Here's the first one. Follow the light you can see. Follow the light you can see. L live or act or obey on the basis of, wh of what you do see or do know. I'm thinking about the Magi. They didn't know where the star was going, but they saw a star. They didn't know how long it was going to stay in the sky, but they saw it. And so they said, I got to follow that thing. I got to move. I'm thinking about Joseph. <laughs> too. You know, if Joseph was alive today and he saw, I think he'd be annoyed at how often we say, follow your dreams. I think he'd say, yeah, easy for you to say. I bet you Joseph was a night owl and not just naturally, but because he was afraid to go to sleep because every time he went to sleep, God came to him in a dream and said, I want you to move your family, <laughs> you know? Here, there, this way, that, and every time he went, or as my, my kiddos say, he goad, all right? When God said go, he goad. So what about us, me, you. <clears throat> don't get caught up in what you can't see. Take the next step. But I don't know what God thinks about this controversial issue, and I might not think the same thing, so I don't know. Okay. Is there anything that you're confident God does want you to do? Start there. But I don't know where he'll lead. Like, I, I know this step, but I don't know what he's going to tell me to do next, you know? So... God never promised that he would tell you the end from the beginning. Me either. So don't be paralyzed by the shaded spots on the horizon. Just start moving. Don't get distracted by what you can't see or don't know. Follow the light you can see. You get the point. Number two, bring God your best. Bring God your best. It's the Magi again. They brought in these gifts. This is where we actually get the tradition of giving gifts to each other. So bring these gifts. They brought him good gifts, best gifts. We know that not all gifts are equal. Some of us, some of us treat Jesus like a white elephant exchange. You know those, yeah, I don't know about you, we actually had a shelf on our house at one point with stuff that we acquired that was worthless. And so we just like put it on the shelf and then when we go to one of those white elephant gift parties, just grab something off the shelf and go, you know. Some of us treat Jesus that way. Hey Jesus, here are these night binoculars. I don't why you need them? Here's a Snuggie. Hey, Jesus, have this yo-yo. I bought you, Jesus, I bought you this, um, it's like a cheese and crackers set thing. Hope you like it, you know? And, and I'm not saying, your best might not be my best. My best might not be your best or somebody else's best. It's not about bringing him the best. It's about bringing him your best. Your best may not be very impressive to you or the people around you. I, it does not matter. It does not matter, just, it's fine, just bring it. Invitation's open. Come to Jesus with what you have, whatever it is, whoever you are. And I'm leaving a lot, of the, a lot of meat on the bones of these stories, but I need to mention this, especially in the Magi story. Part of the point is that people who were very far away, these are Gentiles, not Jews, not part of God's people, people who are very far away are the ones that travel a long distance to bring something to Jesus. So whoever you are, wherever you are, bring, bring God the best you have right now. Number three, lead submissively. This is for everybody in the room who is in some sort of uh, an authority position. Maybe at work, you're the boss, or at home, your mom or dad. Or maybe you just have influence among your friends. Maybe the ca you're the captain of your team or, or the coach. Or again, maybe it's just informally people look to you for, for leadership. I think these texts have a word for us, a negative and a positive one. The negative example is Herod. Herod recognized that Jesus' power and authority threatened his own. 
And he wasn't willing to let go of one bit of the power that he had, one bit of control. So he wound up slaughtering innocent children on the way to the grave. Maybe next year around Christmas, we should be a little bit less sweet and sentimental the whole time. And maybe in addition to the tinsel and the lights and the snowmen, we should hang up something that reminds us that on the early stories of Christmas, a a couple dozen families lost their little boys because one man wasn't willing to let go of any portion of his throne. Now, I don't know if the stakes are as high for you. The results for most of us probably won't be so dramatic. But the fact is, this is the kind of thing that happens when people refuse to let Jesus have his rightful place in our lives or in our world. So let us consider ourselves warned. Herod is the bad example. Joseph and Mary are the good example in this case. Joseph and Mary were the parents, they were the authorities, but they recognized that Jesus' unique power and insight to some degree undermined their authority as parents, and they were okay with it. Now, they still did their job, they still fulfilled their responsibilities, they still raised him, they were still the authority, they were still mom and dad, and and it was hard, but they recognized that there's something about him that actually places him up here. There's always something about him that actually places him up here. So they submitted. Leaders, go and do likewise. Grip your authority loosely. If you're the boss, just remember, you got a boss, even if not on paper. In reality, you got a boss. If you're a mama, just remember that you don't answer to the other mamas in the neighborhood right, or on Facebook. They are not your authority. What they think of you is not the most important thing. You answer to Jesus for the way you are leading your children, for the way you are raising, growing them. Fathers too, of course, of course. Leaders follow these examples. Leaders lead submissively. And then number four, and here's the heart of it. So if you've gotten distracted or checked out, come back to me because I think you need to hear this if you're gonna hear these stories. Number four, trust that Jesus knows what he's doing. Just trust that he knows what he's doing. This is where faith meets the hard parts of reality. And this is the enduring legacy of Joseph and Mary. You don't have to know everything to take the next step of faith. You just have to trust in the wisdom of Jesus. How many of you parents have had the same kind of conversation with your kids? Not the one like what Jesus had with them, but the the trust me conversation. You know, why should I do this? Because I'm your dad and I'm telling you to and I'm wiser than you. Matter of fact, I'm infinitely wiser than you and you wouldn't even understand why if I explained it to you. You know what I mean? Just do it. Just trust me, right? And I I used to think this whole kids and light sockets things was just a cliche. And then I have my own kids. It's for real. Like my daughter did it. My son, my son's three years old. Carson's three. And so sometimes I just like to step back where he can't see me and watch him do whatever he's doing. It's pretty entertaining. I'd imagine it's entertaining with teenagers too, but you got to be more sneaky, right, about not, not seeing you. So Carson, I'm just watching him. He's in his room, and I'm just kind of stepping back, and he walks out of his room with purpose. I'm like, all right, he knows what he wants to do. And he walks straight over to the dining room and reaches down for the, uh, for the light outlet and starts pulling that little plug cover out. And we shouldn't even have to have plug covers anymore. We're just too lazy to take them out. But apparently we need them because he doesn't know better, right? So pull, I'm like, dude, what are you doing? Stop it. Why? Because you're going to electrocute yourself. And he just looks at me, blinks twice. What's electrocute? <laughs> just trust me, man. Just trust me. You ever say something? I know some of you have because I get to hear the stories. You ever say something and then God immediately says that same thing back at you? Just trust me. Okay. You might not like what we need to say next. I know I don't, but I think I need to say it because I think it's clear in this text and I think it's honestly something that's pretty consistent across the board in the Bible. Here's the reality. Jesus calls for commitment first and then clarifies the details as we go. He says, you, I want you to follow me. What's that mean? It means you start walking and then you figure out what that means as you walk. He calls us to commitment first, and then clarifies the details as we go. And since that's the case, this is only going to work if what Luke tells us about Jesus is true, that he is exceedingly wise. That's Luke's focus. I don't know if you caught it. 
That's how Luke begins and ends the story, by drawing attention to Jesus' wisdom. And if you look at the very middle of the story, if you actually like count the words, scholars do these things, if you count the words in the original language and find the very center of the story in Luke, the very center, centerpiece phrase is among the teachers, where Jesus was not only asking questions, but answering theirs. Here's the question you've got to answer for yourself. Do you think that Jesus is wise? Do you consider him an intelligent person? Do you think he's the smartest, most brilliant, most discerning person who's ever lived? You see, wisdom is knowing the right answers and knowing what to do with them. Or, or wisdom, you might put it like this, is knowing the best goals and the best paths to reaching those goals, knowing where to go and how to get there. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. And if you think that Jesus has this in abundance, then you're not going to find trusting him burdensome. But if you don't think he has this in abundance, if you're not actually convinced that he is wise, then I'm not sure true worship is possible. I'm not sure it's going to happen. Now, I so badly, almost everything in me wants to try to convince you that what Luke says is true, try to convince you that Jesus is wise, that he's worth following. And there is a time for that, and in time, we will certainly try, but, this, but, not, but not right now. Because this story doesn't end with answers. It ends with an answerer, but he's only a boy. It doesn't end with answers. This story ends with Mary treasuring these things up in her heart. Recognize what that means. It means you keep something in there for an extended duration of time. It means she thought about what Jesus said for a while. You have to think about and decide whether you think Jesus is wise enough to follow even when you don't understand. Let me pray. Father God, thanks for the scriptures, for inspiring a book that we can read together and study so that we're not on our own. And we're thankful mostly because the book points us toward Jesus. Thank you for sending Jesus. Now, Jesus, I'm going to be honest with you. I hope this isn't irreverent, but sometimes, sometimes we think you're pretty weird. And what you call us to believe and do is strange when we compare it to what comes natural and makes sense to most of the people around us. And so we need, we really need to be convinced that you're wise. We recognize that part of this is on us, seeking it out, asking, learning, studying. We also need you to be with us and guide us along the process. Keep telling us what to do. Be patient when we hesitate. Help us to follow and trust that you know what you're doing. We pray in your name. Amen.